Throughout the history of mankind, religion has played a crucial role within politics and international relations. With the world becoming increasingly interdependent because of globalization, migration has led to the interaction of different faiths and cultures, respective Jewish brothers and sisters in Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the birth of nobility with me, your host Ahmed Ali, and my dear and special guest, Dr. Francisco Jose Luis. Assalamu alaikum, Doc. Alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah. How are you, Professor? Great. Uh, I can only feel extremely happy to be back here in Karbala. With, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. But, uh, it gives you the ability to appreciate uh, you know, the, the, this gift of being being here and appreciating the, the blessings and the wonderful time. It does, it does, especially in the land like Karbala and an occasion like the birth of Imam Rabba, yeah. Islam, which I actually forgot to, you know, send my congratulations to you, my dear viewers, uh, as well as to you, Doctor, uh, and, uh, you know, to everyone across the world uh, on a, a very auspicious occasion, uh, you know, the birth of uh, Imam Rabba, peace and blessings be yeah, upon indeed, him. Indeed, because uh, Imam Ridha, alayhi salam, is, uh, is a, I mean, all of the Imams are special, but uh, Imam R- it's, it's with Imam Reza alayhi salam that actually, uh, you know, the Ithnashari uh, well, faith yeah. becomes really the Ithnashari. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's with Imam Reza that, that the particular line of Imams starts. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yes, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a very important Imam for us. Yes, and we'll get to touch upon that either in tonight's episode or uh, in tomorrow's episode, inshallah. But, uh, Professor, there, you know, during the time of the Abbasid Empire, uh, the religious situation was different. Uh, you know, we, we find in the, in the empire, the empire, uh, we find many Jews, many Christians, many people from, from different religions and faiths uh, residing under that empire. So, can you describe the religious situation that was occurring or that occurred during that time? Yeah. So it's very often assumed by a lot of Muslims nowadays that uh, after the Islamic conquest, uh, both East and West, that everyone became Muslim all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. That was not the case at all. It took actually a long time until mm-hmm. uh, the populations in those countries uh, actually converted to Islam. Yeah. The evil, I mean, the Umayyads and the Abbasids were generally not interested in forced conversions. Um, they they um, First of all, because it, it, it uh, forced conversions always promise some sort of counter reaction and rebellion. Yeah. Yes. First of all, and secondly, because when, especially the Umayyads at the beginning believed that uh, Islam was really just the uh, property of the Arabs, so that was one of the, uh, the, the uh, was one of the reasons why they didn't really um, try to enforce Islam on, mm-hmm. on local populations. And also because, uh, you know, uh, having populations that were Christian and Jewish um, also enables, uh, enabled the, um, you know, relations with uh, those countries that had strong, uh, you know, Christian population or Jewish populations. So that was out of, really out of pragmatism that the sort of religious pluralism was, uh, was kept. Mm-hmm. So uh, that sort of policy, uh, you know, was, was kept even during the Abbasid Empire. Although, from time to time, from time to time, there were also you know, Abbasid rulers who tried to, uh, you know, enforce Islam um, uh, through uh, more forceful means. Yes. But in general, it was uh, there was a more or less lenient uh, policy towards religious minorities. Although in those days uh, there were still not really minorities. I mean. Mm-hmm. Especially in the east of the empire, what we nowadays call Iran and Afghanistan, there was still a, a, a huge um, amount of the population that still clung to Zoroastrianism, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had in um, several um, great um, great cities of the Persian, uh, of what was once the Persian Empire, yeah. you had uh, great, you know, big uh, in Jewish communities and Christians as well. Mm-hmm. And then keep in mind, uh, there was, uh, I mean, especially in the east of the empire, you also have Buddhists. Uh-huh. And in fact, uh, the, um, the That's family... Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, people actually don't, don't know. Yeah, that. actually, there's, there's, there's some really interesting relations between uh, uh, Islam and Buddhism that, um, that, you know, that occurred at that time, actually. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf uh, wrote a really beautiful article entitled um, uh, How Buddhists Save Islam. There's uh, at the level of uh, knowledge, there's actually a lot of interaction between Buddhists and, and Muslim scholars at that mm-hmm. time. Uh, there was a very clear importation of Buddhist logic, yeah. Nagarjunian log- logic into 
the main body of Islamic logic. So, so in terms of the study of mantiq, it's very important. So, uh, for example, you, uh, there's very uh, one very important family that became the uh, you know became the, the advisors to uh, to Al Mahmoud, uh, for example, were the Barbasids, and the Barbasids actually were an Iranian Buddhist uh, family that mm -hmm. had converted to Islam, but you know still kept some influences from uh, from, from from Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So one needs to, to keep these things in mind. Uh, it was uh, it was a pluri. It was, it was a multicultural and also, um, you know, uh, pluri-religious empire, and uh, one also needed to take into account uh, how to deal with that sort of diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it was it was, um, it was certainly from the point of view of the cultural interaction, a, a, a fascinating time, and, and that's where we need to also be aware. Globalization is not something that came all of a sudden in our contemporary age. Globalization actually, you know, already existed in those ages. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, for example, uh, if we take the Mashhad or Tours, is actually on the road, uh, is, is actually on the Silk Road, which is this important uh, mercantile road between the Middle East and Europe, of course, and China. So there's a lot of uh, intercultural contact that is established between the Far East, the Middle East, and Europe. Through that, uh, through that channel. Mm -hmm. So uh, globalization is nothing new. It's just the way things. Uh, it's just the way how people dealt with it that uh, mm -hmm. that is different. Uh, contrary to today, uh, people still kept their culture, and uh, even though they were able to interact with other other you know other cultures and other religions without any problem. There never was the feeling that one had to adopt, fully adopt yeah. the, 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 the culture of, a, of another. There was no real desire of one culture trying to dominate over all other. Different and, today. Yeah, it's very different today when we have this, uh, this, this, uh, this invasion of uh, Western modernity, which is very different from the traditional West, of course. But uh, these are these are questions I think for another show. Yeah, I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. Inshallah, yeah. we can have Inshallah. a show on that. Uh, but you know, you mentioned that so many cultures that you know live under that Abbasid Empire, uh, and so many faiths as well. The the, the, the various religions you mentioned. Were there any conflicts going on, or was it just you know everyone lived their life happily? Well, I mean, it was a bit complicated because see, the Abbasids were of course in conflict with Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. And which made the situation of uh, Christians a bit complicated because they were seen as very often as a fifth column. And this becomes very obvious in the story uh, that is narrated in our Hadith tradition, for example, about the, uh, the mother of our master, the Prophet Imam. Uh, and uh, Hazrat Nargis, uh, yeah. who, according to the narrations, is a Byzantine princess. And um, the, the, the background of the story, uh, of course, uh, brings to light the, the suspicion under which Christians in the Abbasid Empire lived, uh, because uh, the, um, the Christians uh, still lived under the spiritual jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. So while they were living in, Christ, in, in Muslim lands, they were spiritually loyal to the head of the Orthodox Church in Constantinople, mm -hmm. so for them it was a bit, uh, it was a, it, it was sometimes quite difficult and mm -hmm. to be seen as a, as a fifth column. Although that was not the case of all Christians, for example, Armenian Christians were mm -hmm. were in a different uh, different case altogether, uh, together, or Chaldean Christians as well, and Nestorians, of course, um, all together as well. And that also needs to be emphasized when we speak about Christians. We also need to be aware that there's a whole range of different types of Christians. Yes, for example. Um, in, 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 the, in the East, uh, so we, we find a type of Christianity that has, you know, that has pretty much disappeared in the West, which is, which is Nestorian Christianity. Nestorians were Christians that uh, believed that even though Christ had a divine and a human nature, these two natures did not intermix. Uh, so that, uh, for example, they refused to call uh, Hadad Maryam alayhi salam. They used to, they, they refused to call her. Mother of God, Theotokos, which is a title that was given to her uh, by the uh, Council of um, uh, Ephesus. Um, the, the Nestorians refused that because they, they, they very clearly saw that even though in their, in, in their theology, Jesus is, uh, Jesus as a human being is bearing 
or is carrying with him the, the, the divine nature of God, God the Word, of God the Son, the two natures do not intermix, uh, which is actually more, more compatible with a certain type of Islamic theology regarding, mm -hmm. regarding yes. the Imams. Uh, whereas, you know, the, 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 the conciliar Christianity, which became the Catholic and the Orthodox Church, do, uh, you know, do believe in the homousia, meaning that the two natures are intertwined and intermixed, yes. which we categorically refuse. Mm -hmm. But one needs to take into account that there were different, so these different types of Christians also in the Abbasid Empire. And so mm -hmm. when, when we read the Hadith uh, narrations about interaction with Christians, we need to be aware that there were different types of Christians. And interestingly enough, a lot of the converts to, um, to the uh, Islam of the Ahlbayt came from uh, the Nestorian tradition, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite interesting because when we look at the history of uh, you know, um, imami theology, in a sense, uh, these debates about the nature of the imam, the, the relationship between the nasut, uh, the human aspect of the imam, the malakuti aspect of the imam, that is the, uh, that is, um, the um, celestial aspect of the imam, and the lahuti aspect of the imam, that is the imam as the manifestation of the attributes of God, mm -hmm. we're actually still continuing debates that were going on in 3rd, 4th century Christianity. Yeah. So, and, and that is why it's very unfair when, for example, uh, for example certain people in the West um, you know, claim that there is no possible uh, interaction between Christianity and, and Islam. Um, Islam, uh, early Islam and, and, and Christianity had actually very, um, they actually shared a lot of the common issues and debates. So, so you have this uh, cross-pollination of ideas that goes on in, in both ways. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, very interesting. Yeah, we'll get to actually touch upon that. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to rush it a little bit. Uh, but yes, uh, as you mentioned, you know, a, a, a conflict did happen, but they were on a, a minor scale. But there's one incident that happened during the time of Imam Raba I know we're jumping like years into the life of the Imam, uh, but the debate that happened between him and, and the figures, the prominent figures of other religious uh, faith and or, or religions, we find that Imam Rabab, that incident was very interesting, I'll let you talk about that, but what was the context of that uh, incident? Well, as you know, um, you know, the, the Caliph of Haim al Mahmoon actually had decided to um, nominate Imam Rada as his successor. Mm -hmm. uh, and it comes at a time when uh, the, uh, that branch of the Abbasid family had to seek um, some sort of support by the Alids, well, what we nowadays would call the Shia, but in those days we call it the, 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 the Alawis, the, the supporters of the, of the Ahl Bayt And uh, so it, it's uh, by nominating the Imam as his successor, it was a way for him to gain that political control, that political support for his rule, because you know he was in conflict with his brother, who um, was, was in control of the western part of the Abbasid Empire. So it was a way to, to gain support of the, um, of the Alids. Um, and of course this brought up, I mean, he was also opening up a can of worms because uh, this it brought is. into question, of course, the whole legitimacy of the Abbasid uh, family. Because basically when you're accepting to being the heir to the throne, you know, you're, you're kind of admitting, wouldn't that deviate the Muslims at that time? Or no? Well, it, it's a very, uh, the can of worms consists in the following, in, in the following issues. If the Abbasids were legitimate rulers, mm -hmm. why give the rule away to one of the Alids? Exactly. Exactly. Because the the the, um, the, uh, the narrative of the Abbasids is that they were the Ahl al Bayt, and, and, and that they were the, the you know the, the proper legitimate uh, successors to the uh, to the caliphal uh, authority. Now, by giving away that authority to the uh, to the Alids. Um, al Mahmoun is sort of questioning the whole narrative of his own lineage, right? So it's it's a, and on the other hand, uh, there's another it's another there's another problem here. If Imam Reza alayhi salam were to accept that position, which he did eventually, which he he did, but then of course he says that he was forced to do so. Yeah. But that would mean that he would that he would have um, accepted the authority, accepted the the, the the you know the 
legitimacy of the of the Abbasid Empire, Empire yeah. which has caused another question, and which is also, I mean, is also you know beautifully shown in that series uh, that um, you know the, the Iranian state, oh, yeah, state, yeah. state television made about Imam Reza, uh, where uh, there's this beautiful moment where um, Imam is about to play uh, to, to to pay his bayah to the Imam. And uh, the Imam says, well, you know, uh, you're giving me the uh, Khilafah, but are you an authority to be able to give me the Khilafah? Wow. And, 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 yeah, it's, and it's a very important question because the thing is this, is that we believe, and that has always been the, the doctrine of the Imams, is that, the, that, that all power only comes from God. All legitimate authority can, can only come from God. Uh, the Imam is the Imam, he's the Khalifa, uh, even if there's only one person on earth. And even if that one person were to you know, uh, not acknowledge him as, as, the, as the Imam or the Khalifa, he still remains the Khalifa. Yeah. I mean, proof for that is, uh, you know, when, when Nuh was in the Ark, right, and the whole, in, and, and, and the world was being sub submerged with the flood and all, most of humanity was being destroyed by the flood, he still remains the, um, the Imam and Caliph of, yeah. of, of the age. Because there's a certain tendency nowadays to argue that even though the Imam receives his power from God, he still needs to, the people to recognize him to be effectively the Imam. Mm -hmm. And that is something as a very modern idea, and there are problems with it. Mm -hmm. Because, and I take here the uh, argument of uh, Joseph de Mest uh, regarding this issue, um, without the Imam, there would be no people, there would be no Ummah. Because it is the Imam slash the Prophet who created the very notion of the Ummah. Exactly. So, so the, the Ummah is in no position uh, really to, to, to have any power of decision on who becomes the, uh, the Khalifa. Because mm -hmm. without the Khalifa there would be no, there would be no Ummah and the lesser cannot decide over the greater. Mm -hmm. It's a logical, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's quite logical. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole, you know, can of worms is opened up by that, uh, mm -hmm. by, by, by that situation. Mm -hmm. And it's in that situation that, you know, this debate occurs, mm -hmm. right? And in a way to, because of course the, uh, the, the caliphs, as proof of their competence, had to also prove that they were able to deal with different communities of the empire. Mm -hmm. So uh, al Mahmoud tries to, you know, sets up this debate to sort of prove that Imam Reza is not as knowledgeable as he thinks he is, because let's not forget, during the Abbasids, we have the emergence of this new religious current, um, you know, which we nowadays would call the spirituality of, 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 of Sunni Islam, which is Sufism. Mm -hmm. And the Sufis were sort of the uh, uh, spiritual competition to the Imams. And so very often these debates were organized to where, where the Sufi masters would, would you know, try to prove themselves against, uh, against the Imams. And um, so this debate was, you know, most probably organized in order to prove to everyone that Imam Rida alayhi salam was incompetent, right? In, in a sense, as, as if al Mahmoud was saying, okay, you guys want power? Sure, you know, let's have uh, your Imam, uh, let's, him, let, let's put him in a position of rulership and let's see how far that uh, will take us. And little did he know that he was dealing with the most competent person on earth. Mm -hmm. Because of course, he's the manifestation of God's attributes, and of course, he has all power and competence. I mean, competence I mean it doesn't make any sense for a person to know his lineage and to, you know, play with the fire like Mahmoud did, and eventually, you know, being threatened by the yeah. Imam, you know, because basically everyone after after that recognized yeah. who this individual was going to take over. Yeah. You know, ended up eventually, uh, you know. Uh, taking over and killing the Imam, but we'll get to touch upon yeah. uh, more of the debate, but after the short break, if you will, inshallah, Professor. So respected viewers, do stay tuned for after the break, for inshallah, uh, we'll continue our discussion revolving around the incidents that happened during the time of Imam Rabbala. After the break, stay tuned.
three seconds. Respected viewers, welcome back. Hope you, inshallah, enjoyed uh, that short report. Once again, I do congratulate you uh, on the blessed birth of Imam Rabba. Peace and blessings be upon him. Hopefully, we can go and rejoice uh, one day in his holy shrine. Uh, you know, I was there a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Mashhad, Imam Rabba, it's a beautiful scene. Oh, it is. And it's, uh, I mean, Sheikh Baha'i was the architect behind the, 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 uh, the present day, uh, I mean, central part of the, the shrine was, uh, was an amazing architect uh, and, and, and did a wonderful job uh, creating, I mean, this wonderful structure. Yeah. I mean, the Safavids were had great taste in architecture. And has to, uh, we'll get to talk about architecture over a different, uh, different show. But uh, what was the content of the debate? I know before the break, we talked about the context of the debate and what led to that and you know what were the you know what was the reason for the imam to accept the position of leadership uh under the abbasid uh, government uh but what was the content of the debate well first of all notice this uh imam reza alayhi salam isn't just discussing with any christian he's he is he's actually debating with the leaders of these communities yeah. and and this is very uh significant because it, it shows how the traditional mindset um, functions when it comes to such debates. Mm -hmm. So contrary to this uh, day and age uh, where, where any uh, Tom, Dick and Harry uh, we, behind a computer screen can, you know, considers himself as a, a scholar thanks to um, uh, Chef Google. Uh, Chef Google uh, in those days, uh, you were only allowed to debate if you were in a position of authority in terms of scholarship. Uh, and and it, this is still in, in vigor in some traditional structures, but uh, unless you're a sheikh or, or a, an academically uh, proficient and competent person, you are not allowed to debate over religious questions wow. at all. Wow. And this, uh, you know, just uh, was not the case whatsoever. Because here's the thing: uh, Are we debating in order to advance in terms of knowledge, That's or are we debating just to uh, just to you know just to have our egos? feel satisfied by it and, and, and feeling superior to another. And that is, uh, and that is why there is, there's always been this prohibition on non-scholars uh, debating with, uh, with, with, you know, in terms, especially in this, in this uh, field of, uh, of religion, uh, because, uh, because of the danger that it implies. Mm -hmm. and, and we see nowadays in this religious strife that we have between different communities the world over, it's mostly done by very ignorant people who have no knowledge, no training whatsoever in um, in religion. I mean, very recently I, I came across someone who um, you know who was mentioning a a, a, uh, a revered scholar uh, and, and poet from another from another denomination within Islam, saying that he was going to disrespect his grave. And this is disgraceful behavior because uh, this has never been the attitude of our scholars, ever. Never. Uh, we, we've always, you know, our scholars have always very respectfully uh, disagreed, even within Shiism. For example, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Asai was a great, great uh, spiritual master and a merger, of, actually, from, from, the, uh, from the, the Qajar period. Wrote a, uh, wrote a commentary on the Mullah Sadr of Shiraz's uh, Kitab al-Nashair. And he criticizes uh, Mullah Sadr, but always in a respectful manner. And, and it's always substantiated by proper scholarship. Uh, there was no cursing involved, there was no insults involved. And this is how religious debates are, are, are to be conducted. Nowadays. Oh, nowadays. It's I mean, it's, 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 but the thing is, I, I do believe this is a sign of the Akhra Zaman, this total decadence and yeah. this uh, utter. This utter opening of the ego to 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 just uh, you know s spread darkness all over the world. Yeah. Now, so notice first of all that the, the, the imam is debating leaders and scholars from the other religious traditions. So, the, what are these other religious traditions? Were the Christians? Uh, so, the head of the Christians at that time was the Catholicos. Uh, the Catholicos is um, it's a position of hierarchy within the uh, the Eastern churches. And then he had uh, debates with uh, the rabbis uh, from the Jewish tradition and with the uh, Sabaeans, uh, who were people, we, we have very little information about what they actually are. Uh, it's still unclear. The Sabaeans, I mean, from the debate, it seems that these people uh, were very much into beliefs that were very close to uh, Taoism, although 
um, in the sense that they believed that the cosmos had no uh, had no beginning; it was yeah. eternal, and they had a great knowledge of, uh, of astrology and uh, and astronomy as well. So the Imam debates these three groups, and the debate pretty much uh, is about these the following three points. With Christians, it's about the, 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 the notion of affiliation, uh, the relationship between God the Son and God the, and, and God the Father, yeah. which is a big problem um, from the point of view of Islamic theology. Uh, so uh, the Christians claiming that Jesus is the Son of God, and mm -hmm. Imam Reza alayhi salam said, uh, you know, why do you say this? The Christians say, well, you know, because, uh, you know, um, Jesus had no father, and then uh, Imam Reza alayhi salam mentions the case of Adam who had no father and no mother. And no mother. But behind that there's a, there's, a, there's a crucial issue here which is that uh, the Islam of the Ahlul Bayt um, is really staunch about not giving any qualifications to the divine essence. And that is, and that is what we find very much in, in, in the uh, the first sermon of Nahj al yes. where Amir Muminin salam makes clear that you know God has no has no possible qualifications, and that's what we call in technical terms apophatic or neg negative theology. This is the uh, it's the first part of the, actually the uh, of the Shahada when we say La ilaha is actually a, a it's a form of theological bara. We remove any sort of man-made qualifications uh, from you know from our definitions of God. But then at the same time comes what we call the cataphatic theology. It is what God says about himself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Imam really is, uh, you know, points out that we cannot possibly give human qualities to uh, God and especially this whole idea of filiation. Yes. Of course, there's a, there's a form of, you know, multiplicity within or, or you know, within the divine life, meaning and that is a reference to uh, the relationship of God with His attributes. Yes. But this is not an ad, uh, this is not a relationship of, of filiation, and and, and uh, one would be and, and that is why Islam has always been very careful about refusing outright this the notion of this this notion of Son of God because this notion of Son of God actually came with Philo of Alexandria who was a who was a uh, a, a Jewish a Greek speaking philosopher, and here's the thing. So, and this is common to um, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic theology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the world through what we know, what is known as the Logos, the Aqal, uh, or the Kalimatullah, which is the same thing. Now, the question is, uh, what is the status of that Logos? Is the Logos created? Is the Logos God? And if it's not God, and if it's not created, what is that relationship between God and the Logos? And a lot of the debates that go on until up to, you know, up until the time of the Ghaiba actually are about this. This is a, this is a debate that, you know, that started in the third century, uh, you know, uh, AD and continues and starts with, you know, uh, with, with the Greeks and Judaism and then, you know, continues with Christianity and, and, and you know, flows over into Islam. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a very important discussion that we don't have the time to, to, to get mm -hmm. into. Yeah. But so the Imam is referring to that. With, uh, with Judaism, it's rather about the prophethood of uh, His Majesty Hadrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's about proving the prophethood, uh, prophethood of His Majesty through the use of the Torah. And this is really important because Imam Reza, and this is a point we'll discuss later on, yeah. Imam Reza is using the scriptures of, uh, of the other religions to prove the prophethood of the, the, the Prophet And then he discusses the Sabians on the issue of the eternity of the universe, whether the universe is created, that means has a beginning mm -hmm. and an end, or whether it's always been this way, was 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 infinite. created oh. infinite, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a huge. I mean, it's a huge point of the debate. Uh, I mean, most of the great Islamic philosophers normally, um, when writing their proofs for the existence of God, start with this point. Mm -hmm. uh, where Ibn Sina does it, uh, and all the other great philosophers start with this issue. Mm -hmm. Even our own philosophers, people like you know. Um, Hajar Nasruddin Tusi or Ismaili um, theologians, uh, theologians like Sajistani, 
they start with this with this point. It's a very, it's a classical uh, mm -hmm. you know point of Islamic philosophy. Uh -huh. Now you mentioned that there is some sort of relation uh, between uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and you know, to what extent is that the, the you know if there is and if there isn't, why would Imam al rida use the or use their texts and their you know scriptures? To debate them, why not? You know, use use Islamic scripture. But in a debate, uh, you you you, uh, you need you need to use sources that are accepted by both sides. Right? You need to acknowledge what the exactly. So uh, the, the the Jews will not accept the Quran as a, as a, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a proof, nor will the Christians. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and this is where it becomes very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the Islamic tradition, while accepting the idea that there has been some sort of corruption. Of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the of the sacred text of the Jewish and the Christian traditions, does also acknowledge that you know there's still some parts of it left that are you know in in harmony with the divine revelation. Mm -hmm. That not everything was corrupted, and so this is the uh, for example, um, I refer here to the wonderful book uh, written by uh, Dr. Mohammed Legenhausen, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus in Shiite nar narrations, for example, where. You, I think it's a, it's a hadith Imam uh, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam that is actually corresponds more or less to the sermon on the on, on, on the mount that is found in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. So not everything in the Bible is corrupt. So whatever is in harmony with the teachings of the Ahl Bayt and the Quran is then accepted, and that's what we can work with uh, in terms of in terms of uh, dealing with Christianity and 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 and, uh, and Judaism. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, and and I think it's a very important because but nowadays, uh, unfortunately, and especially in the diaspora, we, we we are in a situation where Muslims who live in the West are very often no, I mean, first of all, very much ignorant about their own religious tradition, which is a crime because when you have access to the internet, access to books, access to free education, access to you know bookshops and so on and so forth, and you still manage to be. Ignorance about your own religious tradition. I mean, that's an accomplishment. That's quite an accomplishment. I mean, and uh, unfortunately, we live in an age where being stupid and ignorant is is seen as a quality. Uh, whereas, uh, I'm, I mean, I deal with students who come from uh, come from the poor regions in, in, in Pakistan, such as Pakistan in India, in the mountains, where so, some villages are cut off from the rest of the world during winter. And for them, going to school is a luxury. And then when you see kids who are born in Dearborn or Toronto or London, and they still manage no, not to know who Sheikh Sadok was, or they manage not to know who, I don't know, Mullah Sadra was or Mir Damad or Sheikh Bahai, uh, this is unexcusable. There's no excuse for this. Especially when we see then later on that our converts, who after three years know all these things. It means that. that that knowledge is out there. It's it's oh, it's and it's accessible. Everyone has access to the internet. Yeah, everyone has access to smartphones and stuff. And the thing is, this is that you know um, uh, nowadays uh, this uh, this this uh, absolutely disgusting set of three novels that was published a few years ago that you know that has been made into uh, into movies. Uh, decency forbids me to mention the name in front of the shrine of Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam. But uh, unfortunately, a certain section of our community, uh, you can be sure that at least 70, 80 percent of the people have read those books. Yeah. And it's quite disgusting knowing that you know our scholars bled to preserve that knowledge and 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 to pass on the knowledge about uh, uh, you know about our religious tradition. So not only are they not knowledgeable about their own religious tradition. But they manage also to be ignorant about the religious traditions of the society in which they live in. So you have people who lived in London their entire lives who are completely ignorant about Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is and, and that is fatal because especially nowadays where there's such a push towards destroying the traditional family structures uh, that, that you know that that Western society societies inherited from Christianity. Uh, and which uh, 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 a danger that also endangers our family structures when we see that, for example, in countries like Canada or the US or, or the UK, there's a push to uh, to force Muslims and Christians to adopt the uh, the acceptance of homosexuality, abortion, and so on and so forth. Um, it is in, the, in times like this that we should really unite and build bridges between Christian Jews and, and, and Muslims to 
uh, create a united front against this sort of decadence. And because of this ignorance, uh, those bridges have not been built. And, and unfortunately, nowadays, a great deal of Christians nowadays see Muslims as a fifth column uh, that, are, you know, that is participating in the destruction of, uh, of, of traditional Western uh, Christian, uh, you know, family values, mm -hmm. which is very unfortunate because we do share the same, the, yeah. the same, uh, you know, the same, uh, the same traditions. When we see charlatans like Linda Sarsour, for example, you know, militating for uh, you know aggressive feminism. LGBT rights, abortion, and so forth, which is of course against Islam. Uh, it, it, you know, if you're a working-class Christian person, you, you ask yourself questions about you know your Muslim neighbors. Then, so it's important to to have this knowledge about uh, Christianity, about Judaism, so that you know, even though we may be different in terms of our approaches to the divine, there are certain common struggles that we have, and we can really help each other. And, and, and in fighting against that sort of decadence that is destroying our, our families. Mm -hmm. I mean, th you mentioned a few points that really need uh, more clarification on why uh, they're either prohibited or, you know, just uh, run upon. But we can discuss this uh, in, 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 in a different uh, way, inshallah. Uh, but, you know, to understand or to learn uh, how to treat, because right now, as you mentioned, the fifth column uh, being Islam, how do we learn from the Imams how to treat other religions? How did the Imams treat other religions? If we can just put that in a few minutes. I would say it is, uh, first of all, we need to go back to this very important hadith, uh, Ali Ma'al Haq wa Al Haq Ma'a Ali. Okay. And this isn't just a hadith about the, uh, the right of the Imam. Mm -hmm. This goes way beyond that. And the, uh, Ali is with the truth and the truth with, is with Ali. Mm -hmm. Meaning what? That any, any truth that is out there, even in other religions, exists because of the wilaya. So if because darkness or the, 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 the satanic forces cannot come up with truth. Of course. So for example, if a Buddhist or, a, or a, anyone says something that is true, it's only through the grace of the wilaya. Right? So when, some, for example, when, a, when a Buddhist says something that is true, yeah, no problem, we, we accept it. But we respectfully disagree with all the other things that are not in tune with the divine revelation. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a sense, um, you know, if, 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 if the Islam of the Ahlul Bayt were this cup, the other religions would be like little mirrors, you know, um, showing different aspects of this cup, but they're not the cup itself. They're not the fullness of the truth itself. Mm -hmm. So we, we and, and the thing is sometimes uh, other religions may help us, will, may help us remind ourselves of certain things that we've forgotten about our own tradition. For example. For example? Well, for example, we do have in the, 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 in, in, in the, the Islam of the Ahl Bayt is a complete integral tradition. It mm -hmm. has fiqh, yes. it has akhlaq, it, but it also has an important uh, spiritual content, mm -hmm. uh, things like muraqaba, for example. Uh, so when I see, when, when I look at the Buddhist doing meditation, even though I may not agree with his theology, uh, him doing meditation reminds me of the fact that we do have something similar yeah. within our own tradition. And that maybe I should, you know, the fact that I've, I'm not doing that, um, you know, it should remind me that there is that aspect in my religious tradition. Or, for example, when I see Catholics who are fantastic when it comes to social work, you know, uh, it, 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 it reminds me of the fact that I, I, I come from a tradition where, you know, helping the poor, helping the, uh, helping the orphans, helping, uh, you know, those who are in need, it's very important. Yeah. Maybe I can learn, I, I can relearn what it already exists in my tradition by looking at what, for example, Catholics do, uh, even though I may disagree with their theology. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's having the humility to, uh, to, 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 um, to recognize that even though other traditions may not have the fullness of the truth, they might have some aspects that, that exist in our tradition, but that we have forgotten uh, because of certain historical circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's the position of, uh, it's this, the type of position that consists in saying, Yes, um, you know, the Islam of the Ahl al-Bayt is the fullness of the truth, but at the same time, I do, I can learn something about myself from a Buddhist, from a Christian, 
from a Jew and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. whilst always recognizing that the Imam is the fullness of mm -hmm. the truth. So actually, from what I learned, it just boils down to respect. To respectfully disagree, yeah, that yeah, it's, it's yeah. okay, but you know, just don't excessively, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, disrespect uh, others. We do thank you very much for joining us tonight, welcome, uh, welcome. Professor Francisco, and thank you very much, respected viewers, uh, for tuning in tonight. Hopefully, inshallah, we can, you know, learn from the life of Imam al Rada, peace and blessings be upon him. And don't forget to tune in in tomorrow's episode, for we will continue our discussion on the life of Imam al Rada, peace and blessings be upon him. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Oh, but I can't